the picture of fundraising that I want to draw for you here is picture the universe that God has set out for you that you should be able to fundraise for your work. It might be the entire Christian body. It might just be India. It might just be Gujarat. It might just be the few villages that you're at work at. It might be just the village where you're working. Whatever that universe is for your work, I want you to picture it like an orbit. And I want you to picture all these people here as potential donors within your universe. And then this is the basic funding paradigm, fundraising paradigm that we're going to be working with. Um, this outer ring represents the first order of donors that you'll get. So one of these people comes into your orbit. This is acquaintance. Right here. The next level in, if someone's an acquaintance and they make a few gifts to you, or one or two more, they may start becoming a friend. Drawing a little closer into this center section. They're a little more knowledgeable. They're actually reading your newsletter. They uh, pray for you. They may contact back to you. It's more than a one-off relationship now. It's starting to be two-way. You may actually be in communication with them in some way. They've, they're becoming a friend. They may upgrade their gift. This is part of fundraising. Let's say this was a $10 gift. This might be a $25 gift times three times. This might have been times one. Friend, acquaintance to friend. We're going to be talking about how do you make this happen. Because that's the action of fundraising. The activity of fundraising is drawing people into the orbit of the organization. They generally start at this acquaintance level. Uh, it, it, and acquaintance doesn't necessarily mean the size of the gift. For example, if you get a first gift from a U.S.-based evangelical foundation, staffed foundation, that first gift could be $25,000. And for that foundation, that might be a very small gift. But for you, it could be a large gift. So, but the foundation at that point may just be an acquaintance. They're testing you out. We used to call it putting a chip in as if it was a betting strategy. But really what it was is we're saying, let's see what you do. You, you're kind of interesting. Your idea is interesting. We're getting to know you. We've got some endorsements. Somebody's told you, you're, told us that you were good. You're, I, you, you, you've attracted us. Here's a gift. Let's see what happens. That's acquaintance. Friend, there's a little more interaction. This next level in, it starts getting very, uh, very serious. They move from friend to advocate. At this level, they're not just giving you money. They're encouraging others to help. Uh, the social media in the U.S. And in, um, and in some of the other dominant technology cultures, China and, and India, you might start seeing advocacy happen with uh, what somebody described during the break as micro-gifts. So again, it may not be the dollar amount, it may be the frequency, but it's based on advocacy. Somebody is pushing your stuff around to other people and telling them about it. And one of the things we're going to learn in fundraising is that endorsements are everything. That is, people talking about you to other people. Or people who are interested in giving to your work, asking someone that knows you, what about that guy? Is that, is that a good work? Uh, th this goes on in fundraising. It's the connecting. We're going get, to get into that. This next level in... The one closest to the center is advisor. These are people that you are now entering a fairly intimate relationship with. They're people you might be looking to for advice. They may be very so interested in your work that they actually come to you with thoughts. They may be trusted enough because you've moved through these layers that, that you'll listen to them. 
generally at this level of advisor, they're starting to take a deeper interest in your work to the point where they actually care about your organization almost as much as your purpose. Because all of these people, acquaintance, friend, and advocate, right up to that level, really don't care about your organization. You gotta get over that idea. This isn't about you or your organization at that level of giving. It's about your purpose. It's about what you're accomplishing. It's not about you. That's what we've been talking about uh, in, in terms of this idea that you're making offerings. What you're doing at these levels of gifts is you're saying, come participate with me in this calling. Be an investor in this calling. They're less interested in your organization than they are in your purpose. However, when they start getting in real close, they start getting interested in the organization as well. How well does this run? Is there a way I can be helpful? It's from this group of people here that you can begin to attract what's in this deep center, and that's your board, your accountability structure. The only people you want in the center of this orbit are people that have worked through all of these rings. Not flown through them, worked through them. You want an accountability structure of people that have two loves. First love is the purpose of the organization. They're deeply attracted to what it is you're doing. Partnership, training, of leaders, whatever it is you're doing, they're deeply attracted to that purpose. And they've been giving you money, been advocating for you, they've done it over and over again, and they've moved deep into this orbit. When they move into this place, they've gotta have a second love. And that is they have to love the organization. You don't want anybody in your accountability structure, your board, at all, that doesn't have both loves at an equal basis, a love of the organization and a love of its purpose. The reason is, is this is the engine of your fundraising. This is counterintuitive. This isn't about your clever marketing strategies or, or, or your offers or anything else. It's about how strong is your accountability structure because it is a center of gravity. It pulls your donors in, and you don't want anybody in there that isn't sold out to the organization as well as the purpose. They also have to be people who are very mature in Christ. So you don't want any newbies in here. Just because they're wealthy, or just because they want to have some prestige and serve on your board, it's a big mistake to put folks like that into your central orbit. It'll break up your fundraising. It'll break up the power of the organization and the calling on it. There's five elements to donor motivation. Donor motivation. Five elements. I'm trying to keep it simple. The first is your character. This is your reputation. This is what people know of you. This is what people have experienced of you. Character, reputation. I want to say it's everything. This is very, very, very important in donor motivation. The second is your track record. This is looking back not what you're planning on doing in the future, not what you're going to do or what your aspirations are, 200 million Christians in India. It's what have you done? What has been accomplished by what you've done? When you concentrate on telling everybody what you're planning on doing, you sometimes skip over the most important thing that will motivate them to come alongside you is what has happened. What challenges did you face in your history that brought you to where you are today and why I should get involved with you? In here, buried in this, should be your Ebenezer's. Very important. 
We all work for God. This is a holy enterprise that we're all involved in. If I'm trying to get to know you, I want to know where you and God and the Holy Spirit have interacted in the past in your work. Where are those places that you recognized that were so memorable that you created an Ebenezer? Something that you could go back to and say, oh, that's right, God still loves this work. Where are those Ebenezers? They're part of your track record. Third is your purpose. We're going to go through an exercise on this one because this is what connects you to the donor right here. The donor has a purpose. You have a purpose. David was telling a story of a, of a, of a seminary that he supports. You're supporting the seminary presumably because you have a deep understanding of education and its value and, the, and what it accomplishes, and you found a place where you can give your personal funds and see that same purpose accomplished. That's that connection of purpose. You believe in education. Here's, a, here's an institution that you've come to trust because of their character and their track record and their purpose, that they're going to accomplish that same purpose that you have, and now you're putting your money to work in it. That's what he was saying when he said he had confidence in this. Purpose is your destination. We're going to work on this a lot this afternoon. The fourth is your idea. This is where the money actually goes to work. This is the, could be the seminars that you're underwriting at that seminary. It could be a classroom. It could be any number of things that help the organization fulfill its purpose. This is where the strategies of the organization exist. They're your ideas of how you're going to accomplish your purpose and what you're attracting. This is where the money's going to be spent, but this is what attracts the money. Purpose attracts the money. The idea is how you're accomplishing that purpose and where that, those funds are going. These are the four critical areas of donor motivation. The fifth one has less to do with motivation and everything to do with the presumed partnership, the connection between you and the donor. And this is the communion of giving and receiving. This is how do you treat the donor? What's your aspect? How do you believe about the donor? What's your value of the donor? This is where talking about respecting people. This is where we are equals at the cross. No underdog, no overdog, no Westerner, non-Westerner, no wealthy or poor equals at the cross. And what do you bring to this place of communion of giving and receiving? And what do they bring? And how do you interact? We're going to have a, uh, we're going to spend some real time in this. This is following the gift in a sense, but it has everything to do with your attitude towards who you're asking money from. This is where we come back to this idea that fundraising is not begging. We are all equals at the cross. And if you're with a donor who doesn't see it that way, perhaps you can help them, or perhaps you just say, no, thank you. But if you can't achieve communion with your donors, this connection of equals, the, responsibility, the ownership and engagement model, then the, all the rest of this tends to fall away. This has to do with accountability. This has to do with the respect that you uh, show them and the respect that they show you.